welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. I had friends in school who I graduated with who were from the very start like, oh no, I'm not, I I don't want to do this or that. I'm only going to, you know, kind of turning their nose up at certain things. And I was always of the mind like, I'm going to do anything and everything. I just want to get in front of the camera or get on stage and do anything. And I did for a long time. Hello, welcome to another episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast. Sorry, came in really hot, but I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, and joining us today is the man, the myth, the architect himself, Adam Scott. Very exciting. Uh, You probably know Adam Scott from being the best part of anything you've ever seen him in. Uh, He's the best, and that holds true for this podcast. He remains the best. Uh, This is one of the most delightfully wide-ranging conversations I've had since taking over this show, or maybe ever. Uh, It's definitely the first podcast I've ever hosted that includes mentions of Monty Python, Martin Scorsese, and the film Hellraiser Bloodline. Uh, But it all makes sense in a way that any actor's career can make sense. And it's all so, so inspiring to listen to Adam tell it. Just to hear him talk through his career, beginning to end, the sitcoms, Party Down, Parks and Rec, all the way up to Severance. Uh, Spoiler alert for Severance, by the way. Uh, If you have not seen Severance, go do so immediately, because it rules. How to explain Severance is kind of like Black Mirror meets Office Space, if that makes sense. I don't know. But yeah, please go watch it. It's really great. He's really great in it. And then come back, because we talk about it a lot here. Um, We also talk a lot about the show Lost, Uh, (laughs) as in the show from the early 2000s, Lost. Like I said, a very wide-ranging episode, but a great conversation. So why keep you waiting any longer? Let's just get right into it. Here is Adam Scott. Applications are now available for UCLA's professional program in acting for the camera. Gain knowledge from successful industry professionals and receive a world-class acting education in three quarters, consisting of scene study, acting for the camera, and career development workshops. An intimate classroom environment with a maximum of 16 students per workshop and a certificate of completion from the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Students are encouraged to apply early, space is limited, admission is competitive. Just Google UCLA Professional Programs. You'll find us. Adam Scott is one of the funniest screen presences of the past decade. From Party Down to Parks and Recreation, not to mention a few demonic appearances in The Good Place, it's fair to say he's one of the most valuable sitcom stars working today. Recently, though, Scott added a whole new layer to his on-screen resume, putting in a devastating dual-sided performance in the Apple TV Plus sci-fi series Severance from executive producer and director Ben Stiller. Here is the great Adam Scott. How's it going? How are you doing? How's your day I'm going? Good. How about you? Good. Good. Um, I very recently finished the show Severance. Um, oh, cool. Uh, watched the last episode. So I guess my first question is, uh, how dare you? Uh, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you? How dare everyone involved in that show uh, do I that know. to me personally? Oh, it's such a such a way to wrap it up, huh? I don't remember the last time I was this internet community reddit level obsessed with (laughs) with the show it might be and i don't know i don't know if this will be um a compliment or not i mean it as a compliment uh i feel like the last time i felt this way about 
a cliffhanger specifically is uh, a little television show called Lost. Uh, I, it's been it's, it's been a, a huge while. compliment. Are you, are you uh, you're lost? I lost love fan. Lost and uh, love Lost and that season one finale is I there there are few um, experiences like that in in TV you know and that I'll never forget that moment. It was it's just so great just so great and you know the show you know the ap- episode is wrapping up right yeah you know you're looking you're at the getting clock. close and they finally get that hatch open and i'm just like they're not gonna do it <laughs> you're, you're like tempted this. to grab the remote and be like there's there's like a half hour left <laughs> yeah 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 so uh, much fun it's so much fun to just be wrapped up in something like that i love it absolutely what if we just talked about Lost for the next, <laughs> next 45 minutes? Well, I'm actually lucky enough to be friends with Damon Lindelof. So I just showed uh, my wife and I watched the entire thing with our kids like a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to pepper him with questions uh, throughout, which was handy. Well, I'm curious what it's like, what it feels like to be on the other side of it. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been looking, I was looking through your MDB and I, I was trying to see if this is your first, your first major cliffhanger experience. Uh, I know, I know Parks and Rec, you know, they did a little, the flash forward, but that was more like, oh, that's nice. Like, that's really nice. It's pleasant. It was like a pleasant <laughs> cliffhanger. Uh, it's, I, yeah. I think this is your first, you know, being the central part of a, of a cliffhanger. I'm wondering how that, how it feels, how to be, how to be the one in the know. Well, it feels Great. It just feels great to be on a a show that's, you know, that has traction and that that is uh, resonating with people. It's a real like in the moment. I've I've had shows that where that happens a few years after mm-hmm. uh, there we're making the the actual show with Party Down. It was like yeah. seven years later people got into it and and so it's a completely new, really fun feeling and particularly since we didn't know how it was gonna how people were gonna react and how it was gonna land you, you, we really did i mean i deeply <laughs> love the show both you know when we were making it but then watching the, the cuts as they as as ben sent them to me i i was really just taken with it and so proud but no clue how it was gonna land because it's a big swing it's weird (laughs) and you just never know um and we're in a bubble and have no real perspective at all so we're like well we really like it but no clue how how it's gonna land and, and and so it's it's relief it's really gratifying and, and uh, couldn't be more appreciative and and uh, and and happy about it. I'm curious on a sort of technical acting level, what it feels like to, le- to for you to leave a character on a cliffhanger. You, you've you've been working in this role for whatever time the production takes and you've been, you know, adding layers, creating new quirks. And then you, you, you yourself are leaving the character in a lurch. I'm wondering what that feels like. Does it almost feel sort of like a, like an unresolved note, the acting version of like leaving you in the middle of a line or in the middle of a scene? It's such a good question. Um, yes, it, it does because, you know, don't know what's the other part of that scene is going to be. Um, I mean, certainly there's a moment right after that and, yeah. uh, and it really is kind of ending a scene right, right in the middle of this extraordinary uh, thing that's, that, that's just happened. So yeah, I guess it does. I mean, we shot that scene, I believe about probably a, about exactly a year ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, we got all nine scripts at once because we shot the whole show uh, at, at once, like jumping around the whole season. So certainly have known how it's how it ends for a long time now, but and have always been curious uh, where we're gonna where we're gonna go from there. And uh, and yeah, that's really interesting. It's like it's like shooting half a scene and then taking a a year and a half break or something and then <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's, it's just kind of feels it's fascinating to me as you know you i assume that when you're in the middle of a production you're 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 getting to the next thing you're getting next to the next scene eventually when you're on a show like this you kind of just 
there's no next <laughs> there's no next scene uh, yeah. i'm just curious what that feels like as you know is the letting go process because you'll know at this point you it's been renewed for a season two you'll know you'll step back into the shoes of that character but i'm wondering if the, the immediate feeling of you know well i'll put putting that on the shelf for a while uh, i think also just knowing what a great cliffhanger it is and how just just tasty it is like if like we were saying when we were shooting that whole uh, finale episode just like if they're with us here yeah like when i call her ms cobell on accident in the at the party and heli talking to her dad in the bathroom and 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 then that final moment just like and, and uh irv pounding on bert's door and seeing him with his with his, this uh, other person just all along just thinking if if they're with us if we've got them this is going to be so great this is going to be so much fun both for the audience and then for us to be able to to see how they react and but you know that's the that's where the incredible skill of ben and dan come in is is building that house of cards so they are with us nine episodes in and that's a really delicate process i'm curious just for for because you know not even just for severance for for any tv show you've done that's lasted multiple seasons what what is the the letting go process and then the saying hello to the character again process like so say you do say you do another project you play another character in between seasons of a show where where, where, where do you put all the the mark stuff where, where the, all the stuff you, <laughs> where does that all go between seasons I have a mark room, in my house, <laughs> so I put all of my mark stuff. Um, I mean, it, for, for me, the first time that ever happened to me was we were shooting Party Down, and we shot season two like uh, a little while after season one. And to me, I was like, "Oh, this must be what it feels like to be in a sequel." Like, it's like a year later, you're all in your wardrobe again. You're with all your your friends. You're seeing them again. Everyone is people's hair is kind of different, but you're back at it. And um, and I love that feeling every year on parks. It was like that, like we take like five months off or something and we're Mm -hmm. all back and some like new clothes. And uh, it just feels like a sequel uh, every year. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, because as a kid, I I remember I loved sequels so much because I grew up in the 80s. And so I loved how Han Solo's wardrobe was just altered slightly in each of the Empire Strikes Back and then Return of the Jedi. He had like different folds in his sh- shirt, but the same basic color scheme and idea of a costume. But there were incremental smaller changes. And I love that about TV, too, because every every time we, we show up to do more, it feels like we're making a sequel. Yeah, it's just that that idea that you know these characters have been alive in between seasons. You know, they, like it's and unless you do pick right back up, you sort of projecting that idea that things did happen between these seasons. This person has yeah. had experiences that you didn't see. Yeah, and with Severance, once we go back, it's gonna, it's there's a lot of technical stuff with the show because it's you know playing two different parts of the same person, and so I'm gonna definitely need to you know, get back into the swing of it before we start shooting just to, cause it'll have been, you know, a, a, a chunk of time between uh, seasons. So, so yeah, it, it, it will be a kind of a sort of a reintroduction, I guess, of, of trying to get back into uh, that headspace or whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. I, I do. I do want to back up a little because, because of who we are, because of what backstage does, we are very interested in the, the whole story. The, the, mm-hmm. the sort of the winding road to get to severance yeah uh, I, i'm curious you, you mentioned you know you grew up in the 80s you love sequels we've already talked about lost we talked about star wars I'm, I'm curious what you identify your sort of acting origin story is is there is there like a performance a moment a day where you saw something and you're like oh that's that's acting that's that's something that's something that i would like to be able to do yeah it's it's a very clear moment for me when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark and I had been, you know, fascinated by movies and TV and stuff before then. But that was the moment I was like, I believe I was nine years old and saw it in the theater, my friend and his mom and just couldn't shake it, couldn't talk about or think about anything else until I saw it again. And then 
same thing till I saw it again and just kept. And then from then on, whenever I would find something that struck a chord with me, like Back to the Future, Temple of Doom, any of these movies in my youth, I would just become all about them for mm -hmm. a period of months and just go and see it over and over and over again. And uh, with Raiders of the Lost Ark, it was less like, ooh, I'm going to be an actor. And it was more, I want to do that. Not only does that look fun, but I feel like I connect to what that is, mm -hmm. to that level of, you know, for the next few days after seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm walking around feeling like I'm an adventure, like it was a, a visceral thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then as I got a little older and, you know, in my teens, I, I found Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and those th those movies and movies of the 70s and got really inter interested in King of Comedy was a big one for me of just kind of stretching my imagination out and uh, and really kind of seeing what was possible and really becoming uh, more and more interested in that. Yeah, I mean, we, you mentioned the the connection of sequel. They're still making Indiana Jones movies. They're making a, yeah. they're making a new one right now. It's just that, that sure power of, of watching a character. It, you sort of, in, like you said, imprint on a character, and then you 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 grow up with a character, and you you sort of you sort of fill in those blanks of what's happening between the movies. And I just find that fascinating in terms of you know what you've connected to as a kid and inspired you. Still happening. <laughs> That's still happening. Yeah, today. and I'll be first in line. I cannot wait. <laughs> so when the the actual the the process started I, I believe you you graduated from American Academy of Dramatic Arts at 20 and then mm -hmm. the next 15 years your your resume is, is is fascinating it's sort of the the very nose to the grindstone working actor experience there's yeah. there's there's titles like Hell, Hellraiser Bloodline there's a Star Trek there's The Aviator it's it, that the, the the bouncing around is is very fascinating from an outside perspective I'm curious which of those experiences you look back on and it doesn't even have to be because it was a good experience i'm just wondering what part of that part of your career do you think shaped you most as an actor yeah um i think the beginning is is the most vivid to me as far as like looking back and it's almost 20 years ago now which is which well wait a second it's almost 30 years yeah, ago now. I, I don't know what i was not <laughs> going to correct you but i wow okay <laughs> Pardon me, <laughs> 30 years, because I got here, I came to Hollywood from school in the fall of 93. Uh, so it's 29 years and didn't know anyone and and just wanted to start acting. And so I just started doing background work and getting backstage and, and going and doing student films, whatever I could. I didn't turn my nose up at anything. And I had friends in school <laughs> who I graduated with who were, you know, from the very start, like, oh, no, I'm not, I, I don't want to do mm -hmm. this or that. I'm only going to do, you know, kind of turning their nose up at certain things. And I was always of the mind, like, I'm going to do anything and everything. I just want to get in front of the camera or get on stage and do anything and i did for a long time um like i said i started you know doing background work and then got a, a manager that just got me uh, a quote unquote manager got me like auditions for this or that some of it was more background work <laughs> without <laughs> telling me exactly that it was background work um and i would realize when i got there like oh I'm yeah, I'm doing this is where you want background. me to stand. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah. How would you describe this? Oh, in the background. OK, cool. That's right. But that, that's fine. I was like, well, who am I? You know, sure. And then I, you know, got a guest part on something. And then I started doing guest roles for, like you said, like 15 years. And and then, you know, you mentioned Aviator. That was a big uh, shift for me. Just personally, it was, you know, my one of the people that I had up on my wall uh, and a picture in my locker at sc high school, at Martin Scorsese I'm there. So I got to, you know, I was a small part in Aviator and got to, you know, go on location and watch him make a movie. And it was incredible. And, you know, it was a, a, a different kind of struggle from 2003 on, which was 10 years after I, I remember I wrapped the Aviator 
10 years to the day from when I arrived in mm-hmm. Hollywood. Because I remember it was Halloween when I first got to my apartment in Hollywood and, and didn't know what I was going to do and then wrapped Aviator on Halloween. Anyway, so it was a, a whole other kind of struggle from there, just as a sort of a different tier. Um, not a high tier by any means, but just different. And, and I'm just someone who took a long time to uh, get any real kind of palpable success of any kind. It just took longer for me. And, um, but I'm really thankful for all of that, all of that time um, early on. It, it was all incredibly valuable. Well, it's interesting because I think because of this sort of eventually the one-two punch of Step Brothers and Party Down, people, they, they think Adam Scott and they, they think of comedy. And it's, it's yeah. very interesting that that wasn't your background. And, and especially, yeah. you know, the, the the idea of improv, I think people are, they, you are thought of, from what I can tell, as part of that improvisational crew that's in Hollywood. I'm curious yeah. when you sparked that and why, <laughs> why you sparked, what, what was the moment where you're like, oh, you know, this is, this is the path. This is, this is, this is what I'm going to latch on to. Yeah, it, it really literally was Step Brothers and getting that role. It was a complete fluke. I, I went and auditioned because someone had the role and had to drop out for scheduling or something. So this part opened up and they had these last minute auditions and I went in and just for fluky reasons, I ended up landing the role having no improv experience really other than screwing around on on different sets and stuff I had never really done that much and and comedy for that matter. Um, And so I kind of learned on the job uh, on Step Brothers, which I have equated before. It's like learning how to throw the javelin at the Olympics Mm -hmm. with all of the gold medalists and people with cameras and a stadium filled with people watching you. So it was it was a little bit of a trial by fire. I mean, th- those are like the nicest, coolest, you know, g- group of people. To, a very to, pleasant fire to be. To oh, be learning. so much! It was so fun. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing for the first chunk of time there, but by the end, I had sort of figured out uh, improvisation a bit, and uh, but also f- had found a, a groove with comedy and really enjoyed myself and found it really rewarding and and fun um you know and then like a year later to party down and then that led to parks and and it was just this terrific group of people and uh just sort of general vibe of this comedy world that i really loved and the work was really satisfying and uh and fun when you when you say that you know you you sort of sort of sparked the idea of comedy is, is, do you think that that was because of, of, of an innate ability or something that you had to sort of get in rhythm with? Cause I'm very, I'm always very fascinated by the idea of like learning, learning comedy. Cause it almost feels like a, <laughs> like an oxymoron but it, it, to learning how right. to be funny. I'm curious what the blend of it was for you personally. Yeah, that's a really good question too. I mean, I, I feel like it's something that, you know, because while I was, Growing up, going back to the future 20 times and then later on discovering De Niro and stuff. I was also heavy into Steve Martin and Albert Brooks and David Letterman and Johnny Carson and Gary Shandling and all of these people that really kind of helped form my sense of humor. Uh, Monty Python. My mom was a big influence as far as like pushing, you know, Monty Python, Woody Allen, all of these things in the 80s. And so I had a very specific sense of humor and was my own kind of private comedy nerd slash comedy snob um, without really participating in it. And so then when I started participating in it, after kind of getting through the sort of barrier of lack of this lack of confidence um, once I started feeling a little more comfortable and a little more free, and I guess that was on Step Brothers probably in that process, I found that I had this sort of reservoir of instinct that I hadn't really put to much use before, um, just kind of in flashes here and there. And, and that's probably part of the reason that 
it resonated with me and why I, I kind of found a bit of a home in comedy is because, uh, because I, I, I found that I had a, a knack for it and certainly many thousands of, of, uh, of miles to learn as well, um, and grow. Um, but w once you sort of trust yourself and allow yourself to do that, to grow and to, to, to learn and, and, and the confidence to use what you do have, and then that's a, that's a great kind of place to, to land and, and, and set up shop. Think you can write two feature screenplays or a TV spec and two original TV pilots in less than nine months? If you're accepted into the UCLA professional program in screenwriting or writing for television, you will. Both programs begin this fall. Learn from renowned UCLA instructors and you'll receive a world-class education in less than a year. An intimate environment with a maximum of 10 students per instructor. Guidance from writing your script through navigating the industry and a certificate of completion from the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Just Google UCLA Professional Programs. You'll find us. Something I find very interesting about the sort of role you've settled into uh, in terms of what people know you for is, is, is you kind of excel at either side of the extremes. I, I just know that, that when you show up in something, uh, the character is either going to be the sweetest, most normal man in the world or... A, just like a literal demon like <laughs> that is, that is and, and I'm, right. I'm wondering why what it is about your particular skill set that you that you operate on either side of that line and never really quite in the, the middle of it yeah i guess um i guess a, a lot of the kind of a-hole side of that it started with with stepbrothers and um and I don't know why. I think I just find a holes really, really funny. <laughs> um, I remember getting ready for Step Brothers and trying to figure out like, what kind of like who who who's like this? Like who's because the the role on 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 the page was just so insane and very specifically what you see in the movie. But I was just trying to wrap my head around it. And then I went to a newsstand and got that magazine, The Rob Report, which is. Which is just I don't even know if it's around anymore, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> I've never yeah, it's heard. the Rob Report, the Rob with two Bs, and it's just all about rich dudes and the <laughs> shit that they like to purchase and drive and fly, and like their the jeans they like to buy and stuff. But it's just about like it's a magazine made for guys that have a lot of money and really want people to know that they have a lot of money. And so I bought an issue of that and just started flipping through it and how the guys were standing and and the, the interviews with this investment banker, or this guy and the stuff they would say. And I found it incredible. I just I just found it endlessly entertaining. And, and there is a reality show about this guy who was uh, cut hair and um, and was so arrogant and so like king of his castle and I kind of directly poached stuff he said in this reality show and used it in, in Step Brothers. And I just love it. I, I think it's really fun and a little less fun, you know, after 2016 when it became a dominant cultural strain. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. There's some, some um, thing, but then, but then on the flip side of that, with like party down in parks, it was a, a place where I could relax and just kind of, you know, I was really lucky to get those roles where the roles encouraged me to sort of open my heart up a little bit and share myself with the role and the and the and the camera and the the other actors, which was a really great thing to be able to do as well. And I think that's that's sort of you know what makes the the severance performance uh, so dynamic to watch is it does kind of allow you to flex both, both those muscles at the same time mm -hmm. because you are like you mentioned it is you're playing one person but you're playing two people <laughs> simultaneously yeah. and I kind of want to I want to break that down and I guess the best way to start is just how you mapped out what it what it meant for you to be either. Any or Audi. What did what did it mean for you in that moment to to be one or the other? Yeah, it it was a 
an interesting thing to figure out because, you know, there is a part of any actor with an opportunity like that to think like, oh, well, maybe one of them has like a mustache and a limp. I don't know. You know, just trying to get, throw as many handles and things on it as possible to, you know, but, but I think that be as showy as possible or, or have as vast a difference between the two to be able to, not that there's anything wrong with that, but just like to be able to, to do that. But I think what we kind of settled on and what was really important to uh, Dan Erickson, the creator and, and Ben Stiller and I was that it feel like one guy, that feel like the same person because it is, but just different parts of the same, like almost different halves of the same guy. And, you know, cause we all do have different ways of behaving, right? Different, depending on who you're with or what you're doing, you do behave in, in different ways. And this was a more extreme version of that, sure. But, but it was important that it feel like the same guy, but one of them being this person who's lived 40 odd years of, of life and with sorrow and happiness and joy and pain and all of those things that go with 40 odd years of like blood under the bridge, right? And then the any version of Mark is for all intents and purposes, like two and a half years old um, and doesn't have all of that experience and all of those feelings. And while they physiologically share uh, the insides and, and a lot of feelings that do cross over unconsciously, there's a lot they don't share. And, and, the, and so it was a, a matter of addition and, and, and subtraction of going from one to the other. And um, yeah, so it was, you know, trying to keep it and, and how those differences manifest in practical ways, just in the, in the uh, playing of it as well. That, that was going to ask once you break it down into, you know, the actual physicality of it, uh, it's 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 interesting because you mentioned this was the the thing you kind of have to wrap your head around just watching the show is like it is the same person. So yeah. I'm curious when you're when you're sort of figuring out oh this is a this is a small quirk that Mark does outside or this is a small quirk that Mark does inside. Are you thinking of it as this something the same person would do or are you mapping out like oh this is this is why he maybe holds himself like this or this is this is why he sits like this this is why he tilts his head when he talks the stuff like that. I mean, where I, one of the places I started with where I was just tr trying to kind of, you know, when you're sitting there with a yellow pad and a year before you, six months or whatever it is before you actually start shooting and you're just trying to like, okay, what am I, like, how do I, what's my way in or how do I approach this? And, and so one of the things I started with at the very beginning was what if, because there was a certain confidence with the any mark, a certain confidence and a certain innocence, but n not pure innocence. It's more of a an innocence of purpose and a belief in purpose in what he's doing and the naivete of that, but the strength of that also. And trying to think of where that comes from and then trying to think of where Mark on the Audi mark and all of the stuff that's happened to him and how that would affect a person not just that like even set all the shitty stuff that's happened in the past couple of years aside but just the 40 odd years of of life um and so it, it, a very kind of basic skeletal beginning for me was maybe any is everything i like about myself me adam is the any audi is everything i hate about myself. What if that's where I started? And it was a really interesting place to start. It's not necessarily where I ended up, but it was a an interesting way to start so, sort of splitting up or bifurcating yourself into two dif different parts and and how that would how it could you know maybe manifest. And so, you know, some of the stuff that sort of ended up being left over from th that approach was like, you know, there's a difference in a th posture and, um, and everything was, it was 
kind of stuff with the voice and stuff, but mostly we were, we were looking for internal shifts and anything physical that would change came from, from the internal, internal shifts. It's interesting you mentioned the internal shifts because I think the sort of cornerstone of the show is any of the elevator transitions. It's, it's any, Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, a, a performance thing that really gets across what the show is. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I actually talked to I talked to Ben Stiller for for backstage about Severance, mm-hmm. and he was he was he was telling me how that effect they you did the in camera Hitchcocky and Dolly Zoom in tandem with that he you were got you were sort of tearing how much you were how big you were going with the performance and you would just do it over and over and see sort mm-hmm. of calibrate and I'm curious what that process was like for you because I I, I think that being able to portray a shift in personality in two seconds with your face is a big ask for, for any actor. I, I'm, I'm very curious how all that came together and, and when you found sort of what it meant and what it would mean going forward. Yeah, we started doing those um, about, a, I don't know, maybe a quarter way through or halfway through shooting. We shot for like nine, 10 months. Um, and they, they uh, rigged up the, you know, like a camera rig with a dolly track and stuff, and then a little sort of mini elevator set for, for you know, just for like background purposes. It was just this little um, rig that we had on a couple different stages so we could go and do a few of them whenever there was time and or do one over that wasn't quite landing or whatever it was. And we ended up doing them a lot. And I really liked doing them and I could do them all day. I'm one of those that wants to keep doing it. I want a hundred takes if mm-hmm. possible. And especially with something little like this, these, and, and so I, we were like Ben and I are similar in, in, a, in one way, which is, you know, just sort of trying to refine and, and, and find something and, and chip chip away till you really find it and those were those were hard but they were really interesting and 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 they should be hard because it's we're (laughs) trying we weren't sure what they were gonna be when when i we first started doing i mean we knew practically what it needed to, Mm -hmm. to be but weren't sure how it was gonna work and and so ben like halfway through the, our first time with it ben kind of had the idea like what if your eyes flutter like try that and so that's we ended up landing on that and that worked and for me uh it was often just a, a matter of addition and subtraction um also depending on where audi mark was in the story and where any mark was in the story um for each one of those were at different points in each of those lives and so had to go from one to the other or from that one to the other one um, and had to get, you know, specific about those things. But as far as just the kind of contents of the person, it was trying to do a sort of internal math problem and just sort of uh, let some stuff go or, or let some stuff in depending on which direction we were going. I don't know if any of that uh, I it, that's one of those things where I that's why I love doing this podcast because the thing you're describing I don't that it's like someone telling me they 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 can fly like I, I don't so like to, to for me the idea of sort of what's going on internally is so fascinating because it is it is a three second shot it is uh, you get one physicality to to portray what's happening so I am I am curious what what specifically is going on in a in a in a internal character change perspective for you what 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 that means and what it meant as you did 10 15 20 takes of this same thing how, what it what was sort of happening internally for you each time and how you were calibrating it well i i think um like i said it was sort of this um math problem in, in a way sort of a wiping a slate clean and I think they got those got easier as we continued making the show and cuz we were shooting the whole thing at once right so we would be you know start the day with 
in any scene from episode two and after lunch go and do an Audi scene from episode eight, right? So we were going back and forth a lot. And as we got further and further down the road, the the elevator transitions uh, got easier and easier once those, you know, kind of going back and forth became more habitual. And I think as I got to know each of them better and better, I was able to know exactly what those contents were that I was either getting rid of or putting back in to have that internal shift that uh, that would need to happen and that would, you know, almost be, I don't know, sometimes it felt like invisible and there would be no way of being able to to tell that there was any shift at all, but it was enough for one uh, one transition or the other. Incredible. I, I know that we're, we're already going a little bit over time, so I did want to just oh, end, a- end, end on sort of one, one, one question, and it's, it's based on a, a quote I really love from a New York Times story. It's a quote from Michael Schur that he gave to the New York Times about you. And he said his defining characteristic is that he just really wants to do a good job. Um, <laughs> I find that really fascinating. But I'm curious for you, you're in an industry where, where quote unquote, a good job is kind of a bit harder to define. It's, there's, there's not a lot of very baseline yeah. definitions. So I'm curious what it means to you to, to even throughout the the fifteen year period where you were a working actor after it after that the bigger roles the what the breakthrough party down what it what it has meant to you to do a good job and whether that's changed throughout the whole process oh man that's a really good question these are really good questions um, I think that has changed quite a bit actually and um, and I think that has to do a lot with getting older and my definition of what uh, doing good means, not not doing well, but doing good, right? And where those doing well and doing good <laughs> intersect. And, you know, it used to be like wholly dependent on the director or the writer or producer and their satisfaction with with what I did. I want them to be happy with with what I did. I wanted to work for them because that's who I'm working for. And then you really need to get to a place where you're listening to yourself as well and and making sure it's clicking and 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 making sense to to you too because if it's not then chances are that's going to show up and just be kind of one generation lost from what it could be, right? If you're only trying to please someone else to some indefinable thing you think that they want. So for me, clarity is key. So we're everyone's on the same page. So we all know what we're what we're trying to get at. And I feel like that intersection of what they want and and how I think I can provide that and and I think part of kind of getting older is the acceptance of I can do that. I think, you know, there's so much, especially when you start, like I said before, doing background work and groveling for um, guest spots on TV shows. Groveling is the wrong word, but <laughs> maybe it's not. Maybe, you know, because I used to go on five auditions a day just trying to get a line on something and and it was hard and it also over a period of years creates a mindset um and and kind of affects your confidence and sort of your place in the world um and i think as i've kind of gotten older and and gotten more confident with with what i do and also being on shows like parks and rec and party down where everyone's where you really see people clicking and all wanting to do a, a great thing f- for each other and for themselves. And the lesson on Party Down that I got was we weren't worried about what people outside of the show thought at all because no one was watching. So we just made it for each other and for ourselves. 
And that includes the writers and producers. We were all like a team. And um, finding that team, this is a direct <laughs> Parks and Rec thing, uh, that I think uh, Amy said in an episode, finding that team is kind of half the battle. And, and so I think that uh, this is a really long way of saying <laughs> that I think that whatever it is that that director or that writer wants is is what I'm trying to get to and achieve, but not just for them. I'm also trying to do it uh, for me. And I think us coming together in the middle of that is where we're going to end up. And that's where the quote unquote magic might come in is that sort of intersection of what we're all going for. So if it's not just me trying to please someone else it's it's kind of the that middle area where we're all coming together and that's where i think uh, a lot of great stuff happens amazing sorry well, no that is fantastic and i will let you go now hopefully to uh start work on severance season two because <laughs> uh but I, I will say keep in mind the the opening of lost season two one of the greatest scenes of all time. So I, I so think good. It's, it's oh my god! So I can't hear great. that. I can never hear that song <laughs> without thinking. I know, about it. so and good. it's like twenty minutes of him yeah. going back and forth doing his routine. You're checking. You're so like, great. am I? I'm watching Lost, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so great. Incredible. Well, again, thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. Cannot get enough of the show. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, man. Take care. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter, at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.